molar mass. Molar mass is the mass in grams of one mole of a substance. We've, we learned about atomic mass. I can't remember where these slides are going, so we'll just... Yeah, I just wing it. Actually, you know, most of this, I'm just making it up as I go along. I know that's very confidence-inspiring, isn't it? What, what is the atomic mass? The atomic mass is the mass of an atom. The molar mass is the mass of a mole of atoms or molecules or whatever particles are. Remember, a mole is the chemist dozen. It's a counting number. I know it's a, you know, it's a weird unit that you've never heard of before, and so it takes a little getting used to, but it's just a counting number. So atomic mass is the mass of one atom. What kind of units do we use when we're measuring individual atoms? We use atomic mass units because those are really, really tiny. The molar mass is the mass of one mole, and here the unit is grams. And the cool thing about how the mole was defined is that the mass in grams of a mole is the same number as the mass in atomic mass units of an atom. So if we're going to look at the molar mass of nitrogen, this number is on the periodic table. Under nitrogen, it says 14.01, but there's no unit given. So if we use the unit gram, it's the mass of one mole. If we use the unit atomic mass units, it's, a, it's that many atomic mass units per atom. And we're actually not going to use atomic mass units very much anymore. We're just we're going to use grams and moles. So if we have a water molecule, that means that we have two moles of hydrogen and we have one mole of oxygen. Because if we had a dozen bicycles, there would be two dozen wheels and one dozen bicycle frames, right? It's just multiplying everything by 12. When we talk about a mole of something, we're just multiplying everything by Avogadro's number. So then to find the, the molar mass, the mass of one mole of water, it's got two hydrogens, so we're going to take two times the mass of a mole of hydrogen. That comes off the periodic table. And we've got one oxygen, so the mass of a mole of oxygen atoms. So it's the number on the periodic table, but we're going to use the unit gram now. You add those together, and you get 18.02. Your book uses um, molar masses that are rounded to four significant figures. And so, yeah, we've got these periodic tables up here that um, have more digits, um, but we're just going to use uh, four significant figures for, for all of these. If we have something a little more complicated, this barium nitrate. We need to understand what this formula means. This means there's one barium and there are two nitrate units, right? So that means there's two nitrogens and six oxygens. So to find the mass of one mole of this, we find the mass of one mole of barium and two moles of nitrogen and six moles of oxygen. And we add them all up and we get 261.35 which they then did not round to four. Mm, yeah. Pet peeve. Okay, here's an exercise. What's the molar mass of nickel two carbonate? Well, the first thing we need is we need the formula. And again, a lot of these exercises that I do in class are more difficult than a question I would ask you on an exam. Because if I wanted to know if you knew the formula for nickel 2 carbonate, I would ask you that. Um, and if I want to know if you can calculate a molar mass, I'll give you the formula. But we'll practice. So nickel 2 is Ni2+. plus. We know that because the Roman numeral 2 tells us the charge. Carbonate 
you would look up in the table and it's CO3 2 minus. So the formula then of nickel 2 carbonate, we've got a plus 2 and a minus 2, we just need one of each. So it's nickel CO3. So there's our formula for the compound. To find the molar mass then, we look at this formula and we've got one nickel, we've got one copper, we've got three oxygens. So we're going to find those masses on the periodic table. Nickel is 58.69. So we've got 58.69. And there's one carbon, and each mole of carbon weighs 12.01 grams. And then there's three oxygens, and those are 16. And then we'll use our calculators. And we add those up. And your calculator will understand if you just punch it in as you go across. 58.69 plus 12.01 plus 3 times 16 equals, I get 118.7. The unit on that is grams per mole. The other way to express that is 118.7 grams is equal to one mole. That is true only for nickel 2 carbonate. Any questions? So it's a little bit, you know, like maybe this is a, a box of. I don't know. Box of what? Bowling balls. And here's this is an eight pound bowling ball. The NIs are eight pounds, and the Cs are nine pound bowling balls, and the Os are ten pound bowling balls. How do you figure out how much the box of bowling balls weighs? You add them all up. You say, oh, well, I've got three 10 pound balls, so that's going to be 30 pounds, and then I'm going to add this one and this one. That's all we're doing here. Um, what makes it, I think what just gets in people's heads sometimes is this whole mole business. A mole is just a really large number of particles. It's just a giant dozen, ginormous dozen, incredibly ginormous dozen. It's just a particular number of atoms, molecules, ions, whatever particle you're dealing with. Let's do another one. This is kind of more of a thinking, thinking question. Consider equal mole samples of dinitrogen monoxide, aluminum nitrate, and potassium cyanide. Rank these from least to most number of nitrogen atoms in each sample. So this requires a little thinking. So they're not telling us how many moles or how much, yeah, got to enter drawing mode first, okay, equal mole samples. That means that we have the same number of particles of each of these substances. We've got N2O and we've got Al, that wasn't a very good O, it's kind of small. Al, NO32, I'm sorry, NO33, and KCN. We don't know how many particles we have. All that we know is they're equal. And then they're asking us in each of these samples which one's going to have the least, which one's going to have the most number of nitrogen atoms. So we could actually compare just the individual molecules, right? It's like, let's say um, I've got the same number of bicycles, tricycles, and cars. I'm not going to tell you how many there are, but I've got, you know, here's, here in this area, I've got a certain number of bicycles, and there's tricycles, and there's cars. Which group has the most wheels? The group of cars, right? 
Do you need to know how many cars there are? No, because you know that each car has four wheels. Each of those pieces has more wheels than the tricycles that have three wheels and the bicycles that two wheels. So if you have the same number of each kind of vehicle, then the cars must have more wheels. That's what we're doing here, except we're looking at nitrogen atoms instead of wheels. How many nitrogen atoms does each molecule of N2O have? It has two. And how about the aluminum nitrate? Three. And the potassium cyanide? One. So this is like a unicycle and a bicycle and a tricycle. So we have equal mole samples, equal numbers. Which group is going to have the least nitrogen atoms? The KCN. It's asking us to rank from least to most. So that's the fewest. And which one's next largest? N2O. And then the very largest must be that other one, the aluminum nitrate. Does that make sense? We need to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about these different formulas and we're talking about moles and numbers of atoms and things. And it, it's tricky because you have probably have never thought about this before, right? You never talked about moles. Most of you have not had a chemistry class before, so you haven't heard this stuff before. It's weird. And that's why if we, if we take these things and make them see the uh, relationship between them and actual objects like tricycles or something that we can picture, oh yeah, a tricycle has three wheels, duh. Well, aluminum nitrate molecule has three nitrogen atoms. Same concept. Any questions? So we can use that molar mass as a conversion factor because it relates the mass of something in grams to the moles. And so we use it for a conversion factor. So if the, the moles of a compound, yeah, I don't like this, but here it is anyway. To find the moles of a compound, you can take the mass and you divide by the molar mass. And, and so that's a formula. And some of you like formulas, but if we do everything that way, there are so many formulas to memorize that it's just really impossible to keep them all straight. Really, it comes down to dimensional analysis. If you want to know the number of moles, but you have the number of grams, you're going to multiply by moles and divide by grams so the units work out. And if you have the mass of a sample, I'm sorry, if you're trying to find the mass of a sample and you're given the moles, you're going to multiply by grams over moles, so the units cancel out. But the molar mass is the conversion factor. Sometimes we're going to divide, sometimes we're going to multiply. We don't need to memorize these formulas, though, because dimensional analysis will help us to know what to do. So let's do an example. Calculate the mass of 1.48 moles of potassium oxide. And there formulas given there. So we read the problem. What are we trying to find? We're trying to find the mass. What is the most likely unit that we're going to use? Grams, right? What sort of information are they giving us? Well, they're giving us an amount of moles, and they're giving us a formula, K2O. And we're trying to get from moles to grams. Anytime you're going from moles to grams or from grams to moles, the molar mass is your conversion factor. We're going to use molar mass as a conversion factor a lot. Okay, this is a really, really important thing to get figured out. How do we find the molar mass of K2O? We use the periodic table. We need the formula and the periodic table, and this is what we just learned how to do this morning. So two potassium, so we need two times the mass of potassium. Let's get potassium and phosphorus mixed up. 
their masses. Um, so potassium is 39.10 and there's one oxygen which is 16 and then we're going to add those up. 39.1 times 2 plus 16 94.2 What are the units on that? Well, it's grams per mole. Grams K2O per mole of K2O. So we are given 1.48 moles of K2O and we want to get grams. So we want to multiply by grams and divide by moles so that the units work out. The moles cancel. We get our units straightened out. This is straight dimensional analysis. And then we look for the number. So the number is right here. 94.2 grams. That needs to be with gram here. You can't just put it wherever you feel like putting it. You have to keep the units and the numbers together. So 94.2. And then you do the math. You've got 1.48 times 94.2. And my calculator is going to show me 139.416 and the unit there will be grams. I'm going to look at this number that I started with that only had three significant figures. Wait a minute, what did I do? So I had to pause for a minute here. Now I'm getting a different number. I'm looking at my molar mass there and asking myself, why are there only three digits? What did I do? 39.1 times 2 plus 16. It's because my calculator didn't show me anymore. This number really should have 4. There would be a 0 in there. That's my bad. 